Welcome to our cyber church. I'm Karen Love Basinger, the pastor at Florence United Methodist Church on the windswept sand dunes of the beautiful and wild Oregon coast. My husband, Alan, is here sharing with me in our call to worship this morning. If you remember the good old days back in the sanctuary, uh, we would do this responsibly, this reading. So here, our call to worship, our call to hope. There is something deeper than trouble. It, it is, is mercy. mercy. God's amazing grace. Carrying, carrying lifting, lifting, holding, holding us, us in, in all, all seasons. seasons. There is something more powerful than despair. It, it is, is mercy. mercy. God's, God's amazing, amazing love. love. Seeing us through dark nights, waves of sadness, mountains of grief. There is something longer lasting than pain. It, it is, is mercy. God's healing touch. Bringing, bringing us, us to, hope, leading, leading us to joy, joy teaching, teaching us to, us to sing. sing. Let us pray our words of invocation. Great healer, make us aware of your spirit of holiness, wholeness, here in our homes as we worship virtually online. Touch all our channels of communication right now and bind us together across time and space, even as we are physically distant from one another. Touch and heal our brokenness and lift us out of despair and doubt. Dry our tears of pain and sorrow, comfort and nourish us with the many blessings of your great love, O oh God. May we flourish and blossom in the warmth and compassion of your healing love and grace. Help this be a time of blessing for us all. Amen. Hi everyone, I'm greeting you here from my backyard and I just want to say that I hope you're all doing well and are safe and healthy. Um, I do of course miss seeing you all and can't wait for the time again when we'll be able to be together and give each other hugs <laughs> and um, commune together. So, God bless you all, and take care. Hello, everybody. Greetings from the Cindy Beauty Bu Boutique, a.k.a. our garage. This is Cindy and Peggy Hughes. Hey. And I'm going to try not to get her ear this time. <laughs> yeah, as you almost get my eye. <laughs> Anyway, we are at it again, and we hope that you are busy doing things that are unexpected, too. This time has definitely been a challenge, but, you know, we're all up to the task, and we're all going to make through, make it through, I think, just fine. So we miss seeing everybody, and we want to say hi to you at this time, and hope that everything in your life is going well. May blessings abound. Bye.
August the 9th marks the seven-month anniversary since the first reported death from COVID-19. And it's the two-month anniversary of George Floyd's funeral. During our prayer time now, in face of the recent tragedy in Beirut, we pray for all those who were killed in this horrific explosion and its aftermath, for those who've died from racial injustice and murder, for those whose lives have been lost in the face of this COVID-19 pandemic, and for all of our personal losses, we hold space. After we watch a one-minute video of a grandmother in Beirut, this video was taken by her granddaughter, it's on ABC News, please pray silently and we will close our prayer time as usual with Amanda Sarles sing leading us in singing the Lord's Prayer. Finally tonight, amid the devastation of grandmother being seen by the world. Tonight, with so many families in Beirut reeling from that massive explosion without a place to live now, this image being shared across that city and the world. A grandmother, Maya Boot Melby, playing piano inside her devastated home today, sitting there in the corner, her blown out living room, playing old lane sign as her family sifted through what is left. Her granddaughter posting the video with the caption, Beauty from Ashes. Tonight, one grandmother, her music, a sign of hope and resilience amid the devastation. so powerful and we're thinking of Beirut tonight. Good night. Oh 
The scripture today is found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat battered by waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Souls in danger look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lift in me, love lift in me. Who would have thought when we last met for worship together in our sanctuary at the end of February that it would be the last time for a long time? The following weekend from when we last met, the first weekend in March, we were gathered with the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and the Episcopalians and the Catholics in our community 
and we, for our annual ecumenical spiritual retreat weekend. And we worshiped at the Presbyterian Church, so we weren't in our church. By the following weekend, due to the growing number of COVID cases, our bishop has suspended in-person worship and closed the church buildings in all her Episcopal area of the greater Northwest, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, and Alaska. Now, certainly, nobody planned for this. This was not in our plans. As, as one post I saw on Facebook recently said, the most useless thing purchased so far in 2020 was their 2020 planner. Larry Kreider in his book, Bottom Line Faith, writes, like the label on the back of salad dressing, shake well before using, shaking and usefulness are twin, are twin brothers. God doesn't forewarn. He doesn't explain. He just shakes. God shook Job, and he lost everything. God shook Jonah, and the bottom dropped out of his plans, and he ended up in the belly of the whale. God shook the apostles. The vibrations didn't stop till they reached heaven. An unshaken bottle creates a sour sediment like that at the bottom of a wine vat. This was a picture from a picture of Moab in Jeremiah 48:11. Moab had been at rest from youth like wine left on its dregs, not poured from one jar to another. She has not gone into exile. She tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged. Now the nation of Moab had become stale and flat and sour because she was sedimentary, calcified, hardened. God restores nations and people by shaking them up. When this shaking, where this shaking leads is known only to God. So shaking then is a sign of God's involvement in our lives. If things weren't a bit turbulent, we may wonder if God's ignoring us. God doesn't just shake for the shake of sh sake of shaking. There's a reason. The stuff of life is being rearranged and people are going to be affected. Now, Larry Kreider wrote this in 1995. So in our reading for today, the disciples' lives had already been turned upside down and shaken. They had left everything to follow Jesus, and now here they were in a boat being driven farther and further from shore, battered by the waves. They were terrified of capsizing and drowning in this horrible storm that had come up. They were so scared they were not even able to, rec to recognize Jesus when they saw him walking towards them on the water. They cried out, it's a ghost. Really? I mean, how many times have you seen somebody walking on water? And extreme anxiety and fear and absolute terror for your life causes the body to literally distort your senses as we process a threat to our existence. But immediately Jesus said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Do you realize that do not be afraid or fear not is the most common encouragement and counsel that we find in the Bible? Now, Peter wanted to test the spirits. Now, was this really Jesus as he said he was? Or was it a ghost as their eyes were thinking, you know, they saw? Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water, Jesus said to him. And Jesus said to him, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he starts walking on water toward Jesus. But when his mind slipped out of Christ consciousness and focus, and when he went back into the phys physical reality consciousness and he took his eyes off of Jesus and he saw the strong winds around him again, he went back into his terrified state of consciousness and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out to him with his hand and caught him and asking him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? So they walked across the water together back to the boat. They got back in the boat and the wind ceased. And those in the boat, the Bible says, worshipped him saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now Peter was uplifted. He was saved by love. When Peter was able to turn his eyes upon Jesus, as our hymn says, when he was able to stay focused on love, he was delivered from fear, the paralyzing terror that was causing him to sink into the waters that would have surely drowned him. In this past, mo past month, I've been talking about hope. What can we hope in? What's the source of our hope in these days we live in? 
in the first two weeks of this focus on hope, one thing I didn't go into when I was preaching on Paul's magnificent, soaring, elevated passages from Romans was that in these passages, Paul speaks of sin as more of a principality and a power, more of a force of evil, more than merely our individual moral failings on a personal level. That's why I've been talking to you about systemic sin, forces of sin. Uh, You may not personally be a racist in terms of your conscious awareness and your practice, but we participate in a systemic evil. You know, we allow that to happen. So right now, as a planet, we're in this huge storm at sea. We're called as disciples of Jesus Christ to walk on the water, to step out into the waters, into what feels like certain death if we go based purely on our own resources and powers and the selves that we know ourselves to be. We know we can't walk on water of ourselves. We're being battered by huge waves from terrible winds of chaos and disruption and collapse. And where is our hope in this overwhelming situation where daily, you know, when we go online, if we go online or if we read the newspaper, we doom scroll. We just keep, you know, reading more and more in our news feed and almost all the news is bad these days. I'm reading a book by a Franciscan priest, Richard Rohr, contemplative and mystic, contemporary contemplative. It's titled, The Wisdom Way, Order, Disorder, and Reorder. Father Rohr points out that the mystics saw that universal pattern, order, disorder, reorder, in life around them and in their own interior journeys. About six months ago, we had relative order in our lives. Now we're in the disorder stage, We're out on the water being tossed by huge battering waves, and we have to keep our eyes upon Jesus to get through this. We have to keep our eyes upon Him so that we can be part of the reordering of life that will follow this disorder. You know, and we have to keep our eyes on Him to stay aligned with the values and the priorities of God's kingdom. Normal, you know, normal, the order we were living in was not working for so many people, especially people of color, people in poverty, even, you know, the besieged middle class. Friday, the uh, lay leadership nominating team had a meeting by Zoom to look at our current leadership needs and start getting ready for our fall charge conference. And I, frankly, I had a come to Jesus moment during our meeting, an awareness, you know, as we process the state of our congregation in this time of extraordinary stress. And really, right now, at this stage of our disorder, Uh, in our world. We are blessed by all external measures. I mean, we have enough of what we need in this moment. We're safe. We're okay. But we are stressed. You know, it's that inner uh, turmoil that many of us are feeling. You know, we're confined to our homes, to shelter in place. It's been going on for so long. We must physically distance from almost all those relationships and activities that brought so much meaning and nurture and joy to our lives. Most of our congregation is in the high risk, really, of for severe complications if we contracted COVID-19. So we have to stay home to stay safe and wear masks and physically, you know, socially distance if we go out. It's stressful watching more or less from afar as our families and our friends struggle with the impact, you know, one impact of this pandemic after another. Our school systems are shaken. Our nation, our economy, all are in some degree of disorder or distress, much less the impact of just living through a global pandemic. Our health is being affected by all this stress. You can see it in the prayer chain request. Where is our hope in all this? Two years ago, I attended a conference in Portland that I've talked about before. It was on transformational, what's called transformational resilience, uh, where, you know, something happens and you adapt to it, you know, you, uh, you reel from the impact of it, but you live through it, you get through it, hopefully. And then if it's transformational resilience, you don't just come out at the same level you were at. You don't just return to normal. Through transformational resilience, you are changed, you're transformed by the trauma, and you are actually stronger, in better shape. So uh, this was put on for agencies and groups, including faith-based communities in the Northwest, to help them get prepared 
to help our population in the Northwest to be prepared for the challenges of climate disruption. We need to understand that 40% of our population is living with untreated trauma and the stressors that are coming will just make that trauma load heavier. So we were told to be prepared for more, uh, you know, higher rates of mental unwellness, uh, suicide rates, illness, all that. So what we have to do as a church is to increase and strengthen our resilience. Uh, you know, first we have to put on our own oxygen mask and then do what we can as we are able and have the capacity to, to reach out to others who are feeling overwhelmed by the storm that we're in. Overwhelm is a key concept in all this. You know, we're uh, humans in the animal kingdom. We have animal bodies and our nervous systems have to be calmed down and soothed. We're not, we have not only our own stressors individually, but when we read the news as Christians, as people with hearts, with empathy, we get stressed learning of the suffering of others. So the main thing I want to encourage you to do this week is do all you can to keep your eyes on Jesus. And your nervous system, for various reasons, may be so overwhelmed with all that's going on personally or globally that you're too anxious to even be able to recognize Jesus when you see him, kind of like Peter. So to calm our bodies down enough to even pray, to connect with Jesus, to get us out of our, you know, we have to get out of our thinking minds. Uh, it's like they say in the 12-step movement, it, uh, it's, it was our thinking, it was our best thoughts that got us here. So get out of our thinking minds, which are not able to feel the emotions. They're just, you know, doing their own trip. So I encourage you, because of the beauty of where we live here on the Oregon coast, to do two things this week, if at all possible, and then connect with Jesus. So maybe you're homebound right now and you won't be able to get out. In that case, I encourage you to try to find photos or images or videos or whatever of what I'm going to be asking you to experiment with this week. Now first, because we live on the coast and some of you live on, you know, on a lake or by the river, I want to ask you to consider taking advantage of all the healing possible through our relationship with water. came across an article recently that said, even daydreaming about traveling, to a faraway, traveling off to a faraway island where the sand is warm and the water's crystal blue can give people a sense of calm. So this should make it no surprise that actually sitting next to a body of water actually does some pretty fantastic, has some pretty fantastic well-being benefits. According to best-selling author and marine biologist Wallace J. Nichols, merely being close to a body of water, be it a sea, a river, a lake, or an ocean, promotes mental health and happiness. And he wrote about it in his book, Blue Mind, Blue Mind. The term blue mind describes the mildly meditative state that we fall into when we're near, in, or on or under the water, he told uh, USA Today in 2017. It's the antidote to what we refer to as the red mind, uh, which is frankly what a lot of us are pretty caught up in right now. The red mind is the over-anxious, over-connected, over-stimulated state that defines the new normal of modern life. He said that three years ago. Now, as Nichols noted, research proves his theory that being near water can help us all achieve an elevated and sustained happiness. That elevated level of happiness occurs because, according to Nichols, water helps in lowering stress and anxiety, increasing an overall sense of well-being and happiness. It lowers your heart rate and your breathing rate, and uh, you have safe, better workouts. Aquatic therapists are increasingly looking to the water to help treat and manage PTSD, addiction, anxiety disorders, autism, and more. So maybe that's why people are we're all, you know, willing to pay more for a house along the water or a room with an ocean view. Moreover, when we're near water, it increases our creativity. It helps our conversational abilities. But, you know, being near water doesn't only help us during our waking hours. It helps us in our sleep, too. Uh, w. Christopher Winter, M.D., author of The Sleep Solution, says there's some research that says people may sleep better when they're adjacent to nature. No wonder sleep machines always feature the sounds of rain, the ocean, or a flowing river. So in your homework this week, uh, your spiritual discipline practice is to spend time watching the water however you can. Now the second suggestion I have for you to help you feel more balanced and hopeful 
is to spend time with trees in the woods or at least looking at pictures or images or videos of trees and forests if you can't get out. So picture yourself immersed deep in the woods or actually be immersed deep in the woods in some of the wonderful uh, forests that we have around here. You know, if you can imagine the canopy bathed in sunlight, brimming with beauty and the leaves glistening in the sun. The Japanese have a distinct, untranslatable word for this, komoribi. The ground, lush with mosses and ferns, is stirring with the sounds of unseen creatures and critters underfoot. So it's, it's no wonder that a walk out in nature leaves us all feeling happier and healthier. That's our natural habitat, after all. But did you know that something as simple as a walk in the woods can help relieve stress, strengthen your immune system, and even present certain diseases? I think there's a, a link to cancer prevention through walking in the woods. It's the ancient practice of forest bathing, which amounts to a meditative walk in the forest as a way to promote well-being. In Japan, where they have vast forests that make up 67% of the landscape, the government's emphasizing these forests you know, as a way to try to relax their stressed population, overworked and stressed. So uh, they've, they, over the past 10 years, they've established 48 forest therapy trails and they've put more than 4 million into these programs. And so they're, 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 the scientists are heralding forest bathing as a kind of natural aromatherapy with quantifiable effects. Now, one of the advocates of forest bathing is King Lee, MD, PhD, associate, associate professor at Tokyo's uh, Nippon Medical School, and the Vice President Secretary General of the International Society of Nature and Forest Medicine, Nature and Forest Medicine, based in Japan, one of the leading, world's leading researchers on forest medicine. And he says it was, the practice was first inspired by the ancient spiritual practice of Shinrin Yoku, translated liter literally into forest bathing. So, According to him, the idea is to let nature enter your body through all your senses, the fragrance of the forest, the green colors of the plants, the murmuring of streams and the singing of birds, the eating of forest foods and the touching of trees. Yeah, hug a tree. So this kind of living in the present allows you to feel alive, aware and energized. And, uh, you know, it's even preventive medicine in Japan. Uh, they they think that your they have found through research that your natural killer cell levels natural killer cell levels for your immune system are significantly higher after a day of forest bathing compared to a normal day of stress. So translation well, um, you know as I said it, the research shows it helps prevent cancer and other science based studies link forest bathing to reduce stress, lowered immunity, lowered blood pressure and improved overall physical and mental health. Now that's meditative magic for you. So anybody can forest bathe says Lee, just set your own pace, don't overexert yourself, you know, just rest in a quiet scenic spot and just take it easy. So, uh, you know, unwind in the natural elements. And you could if you if you're kind of homebound, you could uh, do something at home like uh, have a terrarium or plants or you know find ways to have inspirational leaf prints or whatever. Presbyterian minister Byron Bangert wrote, do not be afraid means more than rest easy. It implies something like take heart, have courage, be open and willing to receive what's coming. Get ready for the new thing that God's about to do in your life. It's an invitation to welcome rather than retreat. Uh, from the new future that goes with it. Um, it's not always easy. It's easier to stick with the tried and familiar, he says. Easier to complain than to try a new remedy. Easier to live with known disappointments than to venture into unknown possibilities. It's easier even to keep fighting the battles that we know than to take on a whole different approach to living. So three different spiritual practices for you this week to calm your nervous system. First, watch the water. Hang out with the water. Second, bathe in the forest. At least take a yard and walk around your yard if you, if you can't get to the forest. And third, do all you can through prayer, meditation, hanging out with Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or through singing, or through holy conversation and Christian conferencing, through reading inspirational books. Be uplifted by love. Be uplifted by the Christ. He offers you His hand. And he asks you to come with him. With his help and with faith in his love, you can walk on these waters 
Amen.
we're so delighted that you've been able to share this sacred time with us. Uh, after our spoken benediction that I'm about to give, we will have a beautiful, powerful video benediction. So um, receive this spoken benediction. Holy Spirit, so infill our souls with the power to emulate the very breath of Jesus Christ that all who cross our path in life would say they saw his face in us. Let us go forth as people enmeshed in the living, breathing presence of Jesus Christ, hands outstretched to all who cross our path in need. Amen. Out of the stale darkness he rises into the light. Bright rays of sun split the top of trees. The clouds depart. The blue fills sky. The smell of angels lingers in the air. His hair feels the cool breeze once again. This was not the garden, but a new world made from the eruption of hope in a life that could not be held down. We were witnesses to the life that rose from the dead. God's relentless love comes close to us, moving stones from tombs, opening the heart to a new possibility. Death no longer stands. races inside my chest as I step forward into the future, my future. I grasp it with open hands, with a new naivety, a child toward a mother to be held and lifted up and cradled with care. At times I hesitate, I grasp on to memories of what once was, but I know that I'm not alone in my apprehension. I feel the hands of others holding me. These are my sisters, my brothers, who are not strangers to my fears and frailties, who can feel their own scars, both fresh and old, who have also confronted a hope that frightens them. They step in pace with me. Weeping women at the graveside, the scared disciples in the upper room. This is our future, where we walk together toward our new home, built from the hands of a wounded king, the new Zion, forsaken kingdoms marked by borders and divides, where all our settlements are but temporary shelters, sanctuaries of rest for the wounded and weary. Then the Christ returns to visit us as Galilee's boats pull to shore. These places seem familiar. The lapping water, the sand. But we are not to return to these lands, nor those dreams, but become pilgrims to set our belongings in a new home, to wash our sandy feet in some other place lay down our tired souls on a distant promise, quilted from both the today and the tomorrow. And we dine as a day sees another setting sun, sitting across the table from one another, seeing each sweet face, laughing deeply, feeling whole once more. And we see the Savior smile. He knows our journey's end. He pours us another cup, full of His love. And this time, our eyes tell Him that we understand. Him.